All right, let's turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. James chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. When you get there, please stand. We'll honor the reading of God's Word. We're going to get ambitious this week and actually cover three verses. We've been doing about, we did two one week and did one every other week. But I, I pray that uh, we get through it and we learn a lot and God speaks to us. James 1, 6 through 8. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and praise you this morning for your word. And Lord, we just ask that your blessing is upon it this morning. Lord, we... I feel like we've already had a good service thus far, and Lord, I just want to thank you for it. And Lord, I just I pray that everybody here this morning can open up their hearts, their minds, their ears, and Lord, and they hear what you have to say. Lord, that they can look past me, and Lord, and hear you. And Lord, I just want to thank you and praise you for it. And it's in your Son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so in the last couple of weeks, we've talked about Developing patience, developing patience through trials and tribulations. And then last week we talked about gaining wisdom. All right, now, do we remember how it is that we gain wisdom? Anybody know? We ask. Don't everybody speak at once. We ask. God gives wisdom to all that ask. We see that in verse 5. Let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, it shall be given him. And this also goes for any other promise that God promises us in the Scriptures. Okay, if God tells us He'll give us something, we can stand on that. Okay, we can, we can say, God, I ask you for this. Because we, have to, we ask for wisdom. That's in God's will. We talked about that last week. So if God promises it, promises it to us, then it is according to God's will. Uh, 1 John 5, 14 and 15, we looked at these last week. We're going to look at them again as well. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. And so we have that confidence when we ask in faith. That's what it says in verse 6. You ask for wisdom, but it says, let him ask in faith. Okay, we have that confidence if we know it's according to His will. God wants to give us wisdom. We know that's according to His will. That's where we can say, in Jesus' name. We talked about that a little last week. We pray for a lot of things in Jesus' name that God has no desire for us to have. But we think if we throw in Jesus' name, then we'll get it. But it says clearly in 1 John that it's got to be according to His will. But we have that confidence when we ask in faith. The confidence that, that John talked about, we have that confidence when we ask in faith like James says here. And when we're asking in faith, if we're not asking in faith, we're wavering. We're double-minded. And James is clear about what that kind of attitude does to our petitions to God. And double-minded means that we want to straddle both sides of the fence between our relationship with God and our relationship with the world. We're trying to give our focus, our desires to two different things. Our relationship with God is pretty straightforward. Trust and obey. You know, we, we follow Jesus Christ. We seek to be more like Him. We obey His commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. That is pretty simple. Salvation is simple. All that is pretty simple. But when we speak of the world and our relationship with it, and I look back on this, and I mention it a lot, and so oftentimes when we speak of the world, it's very general. And it's very vague. We, we look, we've got the church and we've got the world. We've got God, we've got the world. We've got Jesus Christ, we've got the world. A lot of times, it is very vague. And I don't, I don't believe, I, I don't have the time this morning to try to get real specific. I'm going to leave that up to y'all. 
But, here's what I say. If it distracts us from our relationship with Jesus, if it hinders us from following Jesus, and if it stops us from glorifying Jesus, it is of the world and we'd be better off to purge it from our lives. Okay, There's some things that probably in our lives that maybe we don't have to purge, but there's a lot of things that we need to get out of our lives because it either hinders us from following Jesus, keeps us from glorifying Jesus, it keeps us from getting closer to Jesus Christ. I saw a church sign this week. It said, if it, keeps, if it keeps us from getting close to Jesus, it needs to go. We would, it would not hurt us to get rid of the things in our life that hinder our relationship to God. Now, that's where things get a little hard for a lot of us because there's a lot of things that we would rather not give up. So you're already in the book of James. We look at James 4.4. 4. You can turn there. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now the word friendship here comes from a Greek word. It's a form of love. If we're born again, we are no longer of the world. We no longer should love the world. When we speak of the world, it's, it's, it's the sin in it, the systems, the, the idolatry that's in it. We know that the Bible says that Satan is the God of this world. So when we're born again, and, and we are trying to have a friendship or relationship or love with the world, that is like telling God that we want to be with this ex-lover of ours. Okay, there's a hymn called Jesus, Lover of My Soul. We are, as a church, the bride of Christ. That is who we're married to. We're married to Jesus Christ. And so if we're wanna, wanting to dilly-dally with the world, that's spiritual adultery. We're, we're trying to cheat on God with an ex-lover. You know, because we're no longer in the world if we're born again. We're in it, but we're not of it. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. It's Deuteronomy 4.24. God is jealous. Now, I'm going to say this. There's a lot of people that's very critical of God, Christianity, and the Bible. And they'll say, well, especially when you read the Old Testament, that, that God is, is fickle and moody. No. It's just He's a jealous God, and He wants us to Himself. Because we owe that to Him. But when we look at Israel in the Old Testament, they were a bunch of spiritual adulterers. So if you turn with me to Jeremiah, we're going to look at a couple of verses there. A few verses. Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah is right after Isaiah, which is right after, I think, Song of Solomon. Jeremiah is right before Lamentations and Ezekiel. Jeremiah chapter 3, we're, we're going to read verses 8 through 10. And I saw, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Now it's talking about the northern kingdom and the Assyrians came in and took them into captivity. And that's what Jeremiah is talking about here, or God's talking about here. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land, committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith the Lord. So he, he first mentions the northern kingdom of Israel. And he says, they went after other gods and they got punished. He said, I wrote them a bill of divorcement because they committed spiritual adultery. And I thought, or we, you, know, you would suppose that Judah would learn a lesson from that. When you look in the books of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and you see how the kings of Israel was falling further and further away from God. And Israel was... was as a nation was worshiping other gods and committing spiritual adultery, and that Judah, you would think, would learn the lesson 
But they did the same thing. And so then Babylon came later and took them into captivity. And this is the time frame right before that that Jeremiah is speaking here. But it says, she, Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly. And so I mean, Judah wanted to, wanted to play this part of God. They, wanted to, they, they would give the sacrifices and maybe show up on the Sabbath. But the other time, you would see that they would have idols in their house that they would bow down and worship to. You know, I guess just in case. They want to hit all bases and pray to all God so, so they might would have a blessing from one of them. But because of this, because of their spiritual adultery, God said that they wouldn't hear their prayers. So if you turn over to Jeremiah 11, 11, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Because of their spiritual adultery, God tells Jeremiah, He says, I'm not going to hear their prayers. If, if, even if they, they repent at this point, I'm not going to hear their prayers. And He tells Jeremiah later on, he tells Jeremiah to quit praying for him. And we, we mentioned that a little bit in, back there in Sunday school this morning. That's a sobering fact. That God said, quit praying for these people. Because of their spiritual adultery. Now we may say, well we're not worshipping Baal, or we're not worshipping Molech, or we're not worshipping Asher and these other gods that they might have worshipped in the Old Testament. But idolatry is much more complex and broad than what we want to... We want to admit. Anything that we put above God is an idol. It could be our work. It could be sport. It could be our family. Those can be idols. And when we put them above God, we are committing spiritual adultery. And God is absolutely not pleased with that. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's talking about holding sin, most of the time a specific sin, in high regard. And oftentimes we hold it higher than God. And our relationship with Him in that case is not important enough for us to let that sin go. And so, maybe when you leave here this morning, maybe as you sit here during this service, Maybe it's a good time for you to evaluate every single thing in your life and where you have that in regards to your relationship with God. Do, do you care more for it than you do God? And I'm, I'm telling you, leave nothing out. Because there's a lot of things that we oftentimes assume that it's not hurting anything and God doesn't care. But if it keeps us from growing closer to Jesus Christ, that is idolatry, that's of the world, God's not pleased with that. And so... Every one of us, I believe, have some things in our life, maybe. And there's some things that we can look at and evaluate, you know, by a one, you know, individual basis. Do I need to get rid of that? I've used this example before. I had a woman come to me one time. She was afraid that her smoking was hindering her from being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I told her, if, if you think it is, it probably is. We even see in the Old Testament several times there were men of God that had to confront others. We, we talked about Elijah a few weeks ago. And he confronted Israel. He said, how long halt ye between two opinions? How long are you going to play both sides of the fence? Joshua said the same thing when he said, choose this day whom you will serve. That's where he said, as for me and my house will serve the Lord. And so he, they're saying, both of them, they said, make a choice. You either serve God or you don't. Don't play both sides of the fence. Because if you try to play both sides of the fence, I mean, you can imagine this, somebody standing on a fence, if they don't commit one way or another, sooner or later they're going to fall. And that's not pleasant. But back to the book of James and asking in faith. Verse 6 says, Let him ask in faith. And so when I look at asking in faith, 
I think there's three vital attributes. And, and I don't think this is exhaustive because, you know, when, when uh, I'm not going to have the time in, in a whole week to be able to stand up here and talk about everything about asking in faith. But to kind of boil it down is there's three things. You've got to want what you're asking for. You've got to believe it will be given. And you've got to be committed to the process and the one who gives it. You've got to want what you're asking for. You've got to believe it will be given. And you've got to be committed to the process and the one who gives it. Okay? I hope I don't have to explain that that's God. So looking at wanting it. Too often we ask something of God and I don't think we're sure if we want it. If you ask for wisdom, and gaining wisdom means that you need to spend more time in your Bible and to study and to read, oftentimes we fail because we're not willing to do that. We'll make an excuse, we don't have the time, or I can't understand it. That's not an excuse. If you're not serious about reading your Bible and studying your Bible, you're not serious about gaining wisdom. That's pretty straightforward. If you're not serious about enduring trials and tribulations, you're not serious about gaining patience. Jesus tells us if we don't forgive others, then He won't forgive us. So if you won't forgive somebody else when they sin against you, then you're not serious about wanting forgiveness for yourself. Because Jesus is pretty clear. If you do not forgive others, I will not forgive you. So if we want to get serious about being forgiven of our sins, then I think that means we ought to make an effort to forgive others when they sin against us. And there's a lot of Christians that I know, they'll hold grudges for years upon years and years. Or they'll say something, well, I'll forgive you, but I won't forget it. If you don't try to forget it, you had not forgiven them. We may pray to God to make in us a clean heart, but we re still regard that sin that makes us unclean. And so if we regard that sin that makes us unclean, we've already mentioned that God won't hear us, but if we regard that, we don't want to put that sin away, then we're not serious about having a clean heart. If we say we want to be disciples, if we want more of Jesus in our life, but we don't obey what He clearly commanded in Scripture, or we forsake the assembling of ourselves, then we're not serious about discipleship. If we say we want unity in the church, but we think divisive things and, and condescending things about others or talk about others, I think you get the point. You know, whether or not we're serious about something, a lot of times depends on our actions. And so when we ask for something, we've got to really want it. Because if we ask for wisdom, or we ask for patience, if we're not willing to go through that process, then we didn't really want it. We want, in this age of everything coming instantly, we want everything that we get right here, right now. You know, we're not willing to wait. We're not willing to go through things to gain what God wants to have for us. So the second one is believing it will be given. Now I'm a firm believer that God is highly insulted by doubt especially when we doubt a promise that He has promised us. God promised the Israelites He'd bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey, that He'd bring them into Canaan. They saw the plagues, they saw their firstborn live while the firstborn of the Egyptians died. They crossed the Red Sea on dry ground between two walls of water. They followed a cloud in the daytime and a fire by night. Their clothes didn't wear out. They had all the manna that they could eat, but yet they still complained and they still murmured. And I think there's something to be said about that sin of murmuring and complaining. But they complained. They arrived, it was, I know Terry's been going over this in Sunday school, they arrived, I think it was roughly two years after they left Egypt, they arrived right next to Canaan. And he sent out the spies. And then they come back and some of them said that there was giants in the land. And Caleb and Joshua said, hey, God's with us. Let's go take it. This is ours. But they did not believe the promise that God had made to them. 
God told them, I will bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey. And the congregation of Israel at the time, all they had to do was say, yes, let's go. It is ours. God has given it to us. But they didn't believe it. They did not believe that God could give it to them. After all that they had seen, and we're not that much different. We see God's hand in a lot of avenues of our life. We see God's hand in creation, but yet we still doubt. We doubt that God can give us wisdom a lot of times. We doubt that God can heal us. We doubt that God can do a number of things for us. Adrian Rogers once said that all sin is rooted in unbelief. And I believe there's some truth to that. If you're still in the book of James, I want you to turn just back a couple pages to Hebrews 11.6. I mentioned in Sunday school there's a few verses that I guess if, as you're continuing in a, verse, uh, a book, there's a few verses that you kind of keep going back to. and One of them for me is Hebrews 11.6. Another one's Romans 12.1. We're going to look at that in a minute. But Hebrews 11.6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So we've got to truly want what we're asking for and then we've got to believe that He is. That God is that I am that I am. That He is the Creator and Supreme Being in the universe. That He did give us salvation through His Son Jesus Christ. We've got to believe in that. And we've got to believe that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Again, that's not monetarily, so to speak. That is a rewarder that God will give us wisdom. God will give us patience. God will give us endurance. God can give us knowledge. He can give us a great many things that maybe that the world may look at and think that it's not worth anything. But that is our rewards. And that's what we can stand on and believe that God will give them to us. Because it says, without faith it is impossible to believe to please Him. And so as the Israelites were getting ready to go into Canaan, they had no faith. And what happened? Everyone that was over 20 years old from that point on before, for over the next 38 years died except for Caleb and Joshua. We've got to believe that God is able and that He is God. That's what we see there in Hebrews 11, 6. Now Romans 4:20 talking about Abraham he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to God Abraham staggered not I mean we, we see that in the fact that he offered up Isaac as a sacrifice we don't see him staggering in, in that situation and I can guarantee you I know we would He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Now, and when we pray a lot of times, there's a difference in, in thinking whether God can do it or God will do it. No, sometimes we have to discern God's will, and we've discussed that. But we absolutely know when He's promised us this, because we even see that with Abraham here in Romans 4.20. He staggered not at the promise. God promised him that he would have an heir. God promised him that he would be the father of many nations. God promised him that he would give the land of Canaan to his descendants. And it says Abraham staggered not. So when God, when we look at a promise in Scripture, we, don't, we need not stagger at it. And, and when we stagger, that's unbelief. That's the wavering that it talks about in the book of James. And then the next one is being committed to the process and the one that can give it to you. Romans 12, 1. This, I don't know, maybe we can consider it, this ought to be somebody's life verse or something. 
I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12.1 is talking about commitment. That you commit yourself wholly to the Lord. That you make your body a living sacrifice. You cannot get no more committed than being a living sacrifice to God. When we talk, Paul, he talked about constantly about running a race. You don't win any race unless you're committed. And, and that's what this Christian life is. And too often, we get to a point in that race and we're like, I'm good here. I'm good at this checkpoint. They've got, they've got a little water that's cooling me down, and, and I'm good. I, I'm good without going on. Or when you look at, uh, say, diving. Well, you go up to a diving board and say you're going to do some kind of flip. You've got to be committed to it when you go to jump because if you waver, you're probably going to end up doing a belly flop and it don't feel good. Or maybe to, you know, to, it, to help, uh, you know, that's, that may appeal to younger people that go off diving boards much, but, you know, maybe to older people or people that's going through other things is that, say, if you're going to rehab. You know, I've had to go to rehab myself. If you're going through rehab, if you're not committed to the process, you're not going to get any stronger. You're not going to gain mobility unless you're committed to that process. In Christianity, if you're not committed to Christ, you're disobedient and you're reprobate. And as uh, Paul said, that he did not want to be a castaway. Titus 1.16 Titus 1.16 says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So this is people that's not fully following Christ. You know, they'll confess Him, but with their actions they're saying completely different. It says they're disobedient, they're reprobate. There's no good that can come from that. Especially when we're to be an example. The girls were learning the Bible verse this week, 1 Timothy 4.12, Do not let them despise you for your youth, but be an example to the believers. We are to be an example to each other, and we're also to be an example to unbelievers. And if we're, our actions don't line up with the God that we profess, then we're not doing any good. So double-mindedness, back to the book of James. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Double-mindedness is a sign of spiritual immaturity. Spiritual infants, like Melinda said earlier, they're driven by every wind of doctrine. Anything that sounds good or anything that comes from somebody that that dresses nice or somebody that's charismatic. There's a lot of false teachers in this world and they've got a lot of followers that don't know the difference between the Trinity and MAPCO. I mean, they heap up followers just because maybe the way they deliver something or the haircut that they have or the jeans that they wear. They want somebody young and cool, whatever the case may be. If they're filling you with false doctrine, they're damning you to hell. Ephesians 4.14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So he's saying people that are tossed to and fro are spiritual children being carried around by every wind of doctrine. Now, anything that is moved by the wind is weak and flimsy. You think about it. If it's Now, I'm not talking about a tornado or a hurricane, but the regular wind that we see, if it's moved by it, it's not that strong. There's not much to kites. There's not much to flags. If it's moved by the wind, it's weak and it's flimsy. And there's nowhere in the Bible where a Christian should be weak or flimsy. When you look at the man that builds his house on the rock, and it says the wind and the rain came and the house didn't fall, but the one who built his house on the sand, it says the wind and the rain tore the house down because that house was flimsy. 
Because it was built on a soft foundation. If we don't have our foundation right, we're unstable. And verse 8 says in James 1, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So somebody that can't make up their mind whether they're going to follow God or follow the world, you cannot depend on them. It's like that in the churches. If somebody's double-minded, you can't depend on them. You, you can't trust them to lead you. You can't trust them to teach you. You can't trust them to worship with you. You can't trust them to commune with, them, with you. James says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So single-mindedness, wanting and believing and being committed to what you're asking for, to having that focus, those are the signs of spiritual maturity. Being serious with our relationship with Jesus. Forsaking all others and following Him. When we try to give a little bit to the world and we try to give a little bit to Jesus, we end up giving nothing to neither one. And when we do that, we become distasteful to Jesus. And we see in Revelation, He'd rather spew us out of His mouth. Because we're lukewarm. Mixing hot, mixing cold. So verse 7 in James says, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Do you think about that? Where, where your allegiances lie, where your trust, where your love lie, David said in the Psalms, If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. James says, a double, or, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So in closing, before, I, before we uh, have our invitation and go into partaking of the Lord's Supper, there's a quote that I read from a guy this week. His name's Leonard Ravenhill. He was a pastor and preacher in England. They call him a, a revivalist preacher. He was in the same lines with uh, as him and people like A.W. Tozer and, and Martin Lord Jones. They're some of the great preachers of the past. And they, they write, they've written a lot of great things that, that's beneficial to people. And Leonard Ravenhill, I consider him, of course, he's, he's passed away now, but somewhat of a modern day Jeremiah. Jeremiah is called the Weeping Prophet. And if you ever listen to a sermon by Leonard Ravenhill, he, he would preach like a dying man to a, a dying world. Like it would be his last sermon that he'll ever give. And he had that kind of emotion and fervor. But he has, he has a quote that, that speaks to me. He says, I would rather have ten people that want God than to have ten thousand people that want to play church. So you get... You can have a small group of people that really want to grow in Christ and really want to follow Jesus and really want to live like Him and really want to serve God and you can do an all great matter of things. But if you, you've got 10,000 that want to play church, you don't do anything of any worth because without faith it is impossible to please Him. And so we've got to look at ourselves this morning. Do we want God or do we want to play church? Do we, are we single-minded or are we double-minded? Are we putting our focus on God or are we, are we letting the world drag us away? We letting every wind of doctrine throw us to and fro. You look at a wave on the sea, it'll go up and it'll go down, and sometimes it'll start out high and, and then it'll dissipate and it'll be nothing. A double minded man, that's how he is. We don't want to, I, I don't think that that's something we want to have associated with us as being double minded. I wouldn't think. I pray that that's not the case. So as David and Cheryl come up this morning, evaluate yourself. Evaluate your life. Are you committed to this thing called Christianity? Are you committed to Jesus Christ? Or are you serving other things while trying to serve Him? You know, And it goes into the Lord's Supper here where Paul says, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Being in the faith is believing that Jesus Christ died for our sins and He rose again on the third day. That's the absolute essentials. Going from there is called discipleship. How much are we growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ? How much do we want of Him? 
I'll, I'll give one more example. We went, to, uh, we went to a youth revival last night. And so they, had, they wanted to get some of the kids to lead the singing. And you can worship God in many different ways. But when you had what it amounts to, they was spiritually immature and they was afraid to sing. And it was awful. Sounded awful. You know, now granted, some of them were singing and trying to praise, but they let pressures from outside keep them from singing loud. Songs that they knew. And so, that's double-minded. They wasn't focusing on praising God with their songs. And we're like that a lot of times. We're not focused on praising God with our life and glorifying Him. So this morning, look at yourself. How are you? How are, you are you single-minded or are you double-minded? Let us stand and sing.